Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Madeline Verhovsek. I'm the Chief of Medicine at St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this week's citywide medical grand rounds. Today is April 20th. Next slide, please. And we'll bring up the next slide. So we'll start with a uh, land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton sits on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee nations and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers, have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And with that, I'll bring, we'll bring up the next slide. And uh, I'm very excited and uh, honored to welcome Dr. Victoria David today. Um, Dr. Ikaseko will be providing a, a, a full uh, introduction, but I've had the honor of supervising Dr. David's uh, fellowship and uh, clinical scholar years. She'll be presenting on the topic today of supporting the development of consultation skills in medical learners and the art of providing effective feedback. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Ricky Kasaka. Uh, he's a hematologist here at St. Joe's and our head of service. He's kindly co-hosting with me today, um, and he's going to tell us more about Dr. David. Perfect. So uh, welcome, Dr. David. I'm very happy that you're able to present for us today. Uh, so Dr. David is currently appointed as a clinical scholar uh, at the Division of Hematology and Thromboembolism at McMaster University. Uh, she completed her Doctor of Medicine and Internal Medicine Residency at the University of Calgary and her hematology training here at McMaster University. Uh, she's currently pursuing a Master's of Education in the Health Professions through John Hopkins University. And I will cut to this to let her get started because she has a bunch of assignments due today, so she needs to get this done. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ikasaka. Um, so I'll just uh, briefly go through my conflicts of interest. Uh, I do have some uh, funding through the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and Ken Vector, which is the Canadian uh, Venous thrombo Thromboembolism Network. Um, so the two big objectives of the talk today are first to review the current medical education literature on teaching consultation skills to medical learners. And the second is I, I just want to go through evidence-based strategies for providing effective feedback to learners and how that works in the context of consultation skills. And so consultation among physicians is a key aspect of patient care and critical aspects of consultation identify the importance of both requesting a consultation and providing a consultation. Residents are expected to be able to effectively request and provide consultation. And in fact, competence by design assesses a resident's competency in both these tasks. So uh, for example, internal medicine will have interestable professional activities uh, for both these tasks. So there are lots of frameworks in the literature that can be used to guide trainees in the consultation process uh, and these are, uh, they focus on how to request a consultation, and there's been much less emphasis uh, on uh, how to provide a consultation. Uh, so right now, I'll just review some of the literature on the referral consultation process. And so for requesting a consultation, uh, there's lots of frameworks, and I've illustrated three on the screen. So there's the five C's, peaked and consult. And these are some uh, frameworks that essentially guide a trainee in the process by providing a step-by-step -step guide of what they should do when they're uh, requesting a consultation. So for example, the 5C framework, uh, this is by Kessler. It suggests um, first to consult, uh, contact the consultant, communicate the case, identify the core question, collaborate and close the loop. The PEAKED framework uh, is quite similar. If you look, uh, obviously it's an acronym with keywords. Um, what it does in addition to the five C's is it incorporates identifying the urgency of the consultation and any educational modifications. So an educational modification is essentially how to incorporate teaching and feedback. And then the, the last framework uh, that I wanna mention is the CONSOL framework uh, by Podolsky. 
And similarly, it's quite, um, it has the same uh, uh, aspects of peaked, uh, except it also includes a thank you at the end. So uh, just uh, emphasizing um, uh, collaboration and respect. So ultimately, these frameworks help residents build capacity and learn how to request consults. And there was a study in 2012 that showed that teaching residents an approach to requesting a consult improved their efficacy in communication and in the, cons and the consult itself. And so it's been proposed that using standardized frameworks to guide the consultation process would lead to quality improvement of the consult. And this would be specifically for trainees and junior learners, because obviously as you progress and you become quite familiar with the process, you may not need to, you would not need to rely on this. So now if we look at the literature on how to provide a consultation, and so obviously that's an important aspect of patient care as well, but as mentioned, there is a lot less literature around this aspect of consultation, and it's likely because it's not as straightforward. There are principles of specialist consultation uh, that outline recommendations on how to be an effective consultant. These were initially uh, proposed in 1983 by Goldman, and they essentially provide guidance, uh, 10 recommendations on how you would be most effective. And they were modified in 2006 by Salerno. So I've highlighted these on the screen and I'll just quickly go through them. And so the recommendations, you know, I think if ever all the consultants uh, on this talk and uh, more se the more senior learners and the staff, these will seem pretty uh, obvious, but I, I do think it's important to highlight them for the junior learners. So the first one would be to determine the question. And I find as a consultant, um, sometimes I'm not always given a, a, a clear question. And I think it's important uh, to clarify that. The second piece is to establish the urgency of the case, obviously, a uh, uh, distal DVT in the superficial femoral vein uh, versus uh, uh, unstable pulmonary embolism, um, important to identify the, the urgency of each of those cases. The third piece is quite important. Um, essentially, the third recommendation is to gather your own data. Uh, often we're given information on the phone, but it is important uh, for as a consultant to go in and, and do some of that um, uh, history and physical exam um, yourself. Recommendation four and five are um, fairly straightforward, so being brief and being specific. Recommendation six, I think, is something that trainees don't often think of, and it's provide contingency plans. And so it's essentially anticipating any complications of the disease or the treatment. And so, um, you know, I think this is where it's important to have um, uh, frameworks or uh, recommendation that we can give trainees uh, because it, it gives them some aspects of consultation they may not have considered. Uh, recommendation number seven essentially encourages consultants to be collaborative, which is something that I think we all uh, try to do. But I think the second piece of the recommendation that we're not necessarily as good with, or myself I'm not as good with, is to be clear with the, te the, the team that's called us, um, to be clear on who's responsible for what and to really identify um, who will put in the orders, um, who will uh, counsel the patient on risk benefits, things like that. And the last three recommendations, uh, I'll just go through. Um, so teaching, uh, it's important to incorporate teaching, and that's not necessarily the trainees, but it's actually the person requesting the consultation. And so this is interesting because I'm actually doing a study right now with uh, Dr. Teresa Chan, Dr. Suraj Mithuwani, um, Dr. Brito on um, uh, looking at consultation skills and what do trainees and faculty think are the most important aspects uh, when being a consultant. And part of the study, um, we interviewed uh, both uh, faculty and trainees and faculty consistently brought up the importance of teaching uh, the person requesting consultation. But this was not something that was brought up by the trainees. And so I think this highlights how um, there's no formal teaching on how to be an effective consultant. And so we just learn on the ground. And so as you become more and more experienced as a consultant, you recognize the importance of teaching the service or the, the physicians that have asked for, for um, help. Um, and I think that if we had 
uh, more clear teaching for junior trainees on how to be an effective consultant, they would learn these things sooner and might achieve um, uh, stronger consultancy skills sooner. And the last two recommendations, so number nine is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's about communication and it's really emphasizing to communicate directly with the physician. Um, so closing the loop by phone if needed, if there's anything urgent, any clarification needed. And then the last one is to be clear on the follow-up plan when you're signing off. Sometimes it's unclear if the service is still following. And um, so that's, again, uh, clear communication. So as mentioned, this, there's really limited medical education literature on this aspect of consultation. And this was really the only paper uh, that provides an approach or recommendations. And so unlike the referral consultation process that I reviewed uh, earlier, there, there really are no uh, well-developed frameworks that could be used to help teach or assess the skills during uh, residency training. From my experience, when I work with trainees and I'm trying to help them develop their consultancy skills, I've gone through these recommendations with trainees to give them a bit of a roadmap on how to do a consultation and to discuss some of the less obvious recommendations. I think if you go through all 10, a lot of them are fairly obvious, but um, things like uh, teaching or um, things like anticipating contingency plans or, or things that aren't obvious. Those are things that I would not have considered when I was a learner. And so given the limited medical education literature on how to be an effective consultant um, and these lack, this lack of framework and lack of teaching, I think there likely leads to a lack of um, or a gap in skills in our more junior trainees in how to be an effective consultant. And then this skill is learned on the wards and as we go. There was a qualitative study done in the United Kingdom that, re that uh, reinforces and demonstrated a lack of training for residents on this skill. And so as mentioned, I am working with colleagues, including Dr. Uh, uh, Chad and Mithuani on how to be an effective consultant. And our hope is to develop a framework uh, similar to the uh, frameworks we saw earlier, like the five C's, the peaked, that can be used to guide trainees in the process. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want to quickly uh, identify some of our findings because I th this will form the basis of a framework we will propose. And so quickly for our study, what we did was we formed independent dyads of resident physicians, and we aim to get uh, PGY3 or higher, as well as faculty members from McMaster University's Department of Medicine. They each participated in a simulation session of a thrombosis medicine consultation case, followed by separate semi-structured interviews. The reasons we actually had them participate in the simulation case was to situate participants in a clinical consultation and then explore their perceptions on the most important principles of consultation. Uh, we did do a qualitative study and um, use a framework analysis um, we uh, interview sorry, we analyzed the interview data iteratively iteratively um, and uh, using an inductive approach. And then we conducted interviews until theoretical saturation. So we identified several competencies uh, from the interview data. These are illustrated in the figure. What we found interesting was the relative importance of each of these competencies dependent on, depended on the consultant's level in, of involvement in direct patient care. And so this was something that had that has not been previously uh, highlighted in uh, the literature is um, the different skills and different competencies will vary based on how involved you are as a consultant in patient care. And if we think about it, being a consultant, you operate on a spectrum, um, anywhere from providing telephone advice uh, to having a high level of direct patient care. And so we try to illustrate that at the bottom of the screen uh, with the arrow. At the top of the screen, you'll notice three competencies that span the whole spectrum. And these competencies essentially are main are going to form the main components of a framework. And it, it essentially says that these are critical regardless of your level of involvement in patient care. And these are domain-specific knowledge and expertise, understanding the question or the reason for referral, and being supportive and empathetic with the physician requesting the consultation. This was something that was really emphasized by our participants. And you'll notice some of these uh, um, competencies mirror the competencies that were highlighted on the uh, referral consultation process. 
uh, for example, understanding the question, which really highlights the importance of these aspects in the consultation process. The next six competencies, which you'll notice don't span across the spectrum, uh, essentially they're modifiers. And it just means that depending on your level of involvement in um, patient care, they may or may not be um, highly important. And so these are, I'll just highlight them. Um, so providing clear and specific recommendation, understanding the context and resources available to the phys physician requesting the consultation. So for example, if I get a call from somebody in a peripheral hospital and they're uh, worried about TTP, uh, I have to recognize, I have to figure out if they have access to Plex or not, uh, because telling them to start Plex is not helpful if that's not a, um, cap a capability their hospital has. Uh, collaborating uh, with the physician requesting the consultation, uh, triaging and understanding urgency. And then the last two um, focus on teaching. And we've we separated these out to really uh, emphasize that there's teaching the trainees as well as teaching the physicians requesting the consultation. And so, I, as mentioned, some of these reflect as well the recommendations, uh, the 10 recommendations in the paper by Salerno. So I'll move on to the second part of the presentation, uh, which focuses on feedback. And uh, uh, so here I just have a definition of feedback that uh, was proposed by van der Ryder. And it essentially is specific information about the comparison between a trainee's observed performance and a standard given, the, uh, given with the intent to, to improve the trainee's performance. And so when we break down that definition, some of the key words that stand out for me are specific, performance compared to a standard, and improvement. And so I think it's important to just remember that definition as I go through um, the next few slides. And so before I get into um, some of the literature on feedback, I just want everyone to have um, to reflect a bit on their experience with feedback. And so for the trainees in the room, obviously, I, I recognize you get uh, lots of feedback. This can be written, such as IDERS, EPAs, or verbal. But for the staff in the room, um, we can also get lots of feedback, feedback from our colleagues when we're handing over. And so just think about your experiences with feedback and just consider the next three things. So the first is what examples of feedback did you receive that was helpful? And what made it helpful? Essentially, what made it effective? The second question is essentially on the flip side, what examples of feedback did you receive that was unhelpful? And why was it unhelpful? And then the final question is, what about helpful feedback that was poorly delivered? Did that affect your willingness to accept feedback and how, how did it affect it? And I think it's helpful to reflect on your experiences. So if you've ever had any unhelpful feedback, you can avoid that in the future. So drawing on the literature, I'm just going to go through some of the themes that make feedback unhelpful. So a one-way conversation um, it seems pretty straightforward um, that you're if you're essentially telling a trainee what you think, you haven't asked their perspective uh, of why they did a certain thing, it's probably unhelpful. So it's really important to probe the learner. And I think we all know this. But something that's interesting, when uh, we did our study um, on consultation skills, after the simulation, we actually asked the faculty who observed the simulation to observe the trainees and to provide feedback. When we asked the faculty, the same faculty members in the interviews, how they approach feedback, every, I would say the majority emphasized the importance of being learner-centered and really emphasize listening to the trainees. But when we went back and analyzed the debriefing sessions, we'd actually recorded them, we identified that most faculty had actually had a one-way conversation with the trainees and they had not solicited their perspective. So this really highlighted that while we may know a one-way conversation is not the best approach to feedback, we sometimes have difficulty putting this into practice. Another theme of what makes feedback unhelpful is focusing on personality. It's best to focus on behaviors, and I'll provide an example of this uh, in a couple slides. 
But essentially, if you're focusing on personality, it becomes subjective. Um, when you focus on too many topics, it can be overwhelming for the trainee. So imagine you have a resident who's seeing a patient for pancytopenia, you suspect acute leukemia, and at the end you give them feedback and you mention that their physical exam, you had concerns with how they landmark for the spleen exam. So then you provide feedback on how they could improve their spleen exam. You also tell them that you felt they didn't have an approach for a differential and that they were quite scattered, and then you give them an approach for the differential of pancytopenia. And then you also bring up that they didn't think about all the complications of acute leukemia, and so they had forgotten to rule out DIC, tumor lysis, all these things. I think it's hard for the trainee, if you give them five, six things to, to work on, for them to really um, take that away. Uh, whereas if you gave them maybe one or two things, it might be easier for the trainee to digest that. Generic feedback um, is not as helpful. I don't like to say it's unhelpful because if you tell somebody good job, I do think that's helpful because it's it encourages them. Um, it makes them feel like um, more uh, motivated to work. So I wouldn't say it's unhelpful, but I, but I would say it does not help them improve. And so I, I think being more specific in feedback um, is important. And so you could say, good job with your physical exam. You did, uh, your landmarks uh, were on point. All negative feedback uh, is unhelpful and might just discourage the learner. So it's important to try to identify something they did right. And then the last thing, I think we all know this, inappropriate comments make feedback unhelpful. And so even if you put really helpful feedback and you end it with one inappropriate comment, for example, you comment on their dress attire, uh, that completely discredits the feedback. The next, uh, the next themes I'm going to focus on are the barriers to feedback. And I think this is where um, at least I struggle uh, more with when I do feedback, is what are the barriers to feedback? So the first one is lack of time. I think this is uh, pretty uh, common. We all understand the time limits. The more time we spend on feedback, the less time uh, we have for clinical work with patients, uh, the later we go home. So this impacts um, how often we give feedback. And it also Im impacts the type of feedback. Feedback can be both directly observed and indirect. And so things like communicating with the patient, physical examination, this involves direct observation and is more time intensive. And so as a consequence, trainees will get less feedback on these specific skills. How to address this? Honestly, there's no good answer. Um, everyone is quite stretched for time. I think planning helps, but I think finding uh, balance as well. So uh, not all the feedback needs to be from direct observation, but it's important to at least have one or two um, uh, direct observations. And that can be planned ahead of time. So when you go and meet the patient with the resident, uh, you can plan ahead of time and say, when we go, I want you to communicate with the patient, the plan, and then you'll be able to then um, uh, provide direct uh, feedback to the trainee on their communication with the patient. The second barrier to feedback is fear of damaging rapport. So if you give what is perceived as negative feedback that may damage um, your rapport with the trainee, especially if we think we're going to work with the trainee again. But I think the mindset have to has to shift. Feedback is not necessarily negative, but if we think back to the definition, feedback is really to help the trainee improve. Um, trainee resistance or resident resistance is also another barrier to feedback. There was a study in 2020 that found that residents avoided feedback if they expected constructive feedback but they sought out feedback if they knew they performed well. And also residents sought out feedback based on attending personality. So I think it's important to recognize that even if residents don't ask for feedback, it's important we provide it. And then the last one is lack of comfort with feedback delivery. And I think it, it's why it's important to understand the barriers to feedback, what makes feedback unhelpful, what makes feedback effective and as well, having approaches to feedback. So 
What makes feedback effective? I think you'll notice here a lot of these are essentially the opposite of what makes feedback unhelpful. So the appropriate setting. I think it's important to be planned, uh, consider the place, the time, the environment. So post-call in the hallway is less than ideal. Um, you want to also do it close to the encounter if you're doing specific feedback on one, uh, one specific case. You want to be explicit that you're about to that you are going to give feedback and you want to be descriptive. And that ties into uh, the fifth one here, which is being specific. And so when, for example, if you say your notes could be improved, being specific could be um, in your notes when you write down your assessment, you did not identify um, the most likely diagnosis. Uh, you just identified a differential. It would be important to highlight your most likely diagnosis going forward. So you're providing more specific feedback to the trainee. Uh, being behavior focused uh, makes it more, uh, more effective. And we talked about this earlier, don't focus on personality, focus on behavior. So for example, you wouldn't say to it, you wouldn't put feedback to a trainee that they're uh, lazy or they're not working hard. Um, instead, you would say this trainee uh, is consistently late and other residents have had to accommodate. Uh, they've not followed up on tests and they've not returned their pages and they've not done their assigned reading. So you're really um, focusing on the facts and the behaviors. Being concise is important. And again, this goes back to, uh, you know, just uh, being focused on one to two things they could improve on. Uh, agreement is important. And so essentially, this is where getting the trainee's perspective is important. And you're verifying what you think. So you ask, ask them how they felt and see if it aligns with what you observe. If there's an agreement, the resident is more likely to take feedback and enact it. But if there's not alignment, uh, sometimes it's harder, but you can try to explore why there is that mismatch in what and how you felt they performed and how they felt they performed. And then the last thing is to be honest. So here's a few ways you can improve. I'm just gonna give a few examples of how to improve feedback. So instead of telling a trainee um, or writing in their, their feedback, they're willing to learn, um, you could frame it instead as, um, as trainee responds very positively to feedback. Uh, when I noticed that their physical exam of the spleen, uh, they weren't able to landmark properly. And then I showed them the technique uh, on further physical examinations. They had altered their technique um, to reflect what I had taught them. Another example, uh, the trainee is struggling to communicate well. Um, instead, you could um, be, by being more specific, saying the trainee is using medical jargon when talking to the patient. For example, they told the patient, the CTPE showed a pulmonary embolism, and we will be starting you on doltaparin. Um, instead, you could say, and then you give an example. Um, you know, when you tell trainees, read more around cases. Um, you could tell them instead, there's an opportunity to improve your knowledge uh, in cancer-associated thrombosis. Um, you could consider reviewing the Thrombosis Canada guidelines on this topic. And so these are just some examples of how being more specific and providing some actionable feedback in, in that will really give that trainee much more information to move forward. So... Now that we have a bit of an understanding of the content of the feedback, let's talk a bit about how to package or deliver that feedback and having an approach. So I'm just gonna review two approaches to feedback. There are many more in the literature. Um, and so I think it's just important to, under, to, to have an approach, whichever it is. Um, the two I have up on the screen, the first is the RxOCR. And I brought this one up because it's the one through the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and it's used um, in the setting of workplace-based workplace -based assessments, so entrustable professional activities. And then the other one is the R2C2. And it's for uh, a uh, component, and so there are five components. So it's... Um, rapport, expectations, observation, coaching, and recording. And so 
In terms of establishing educational rapport with the trainee, essentially, you really want to just understand the trainee's knowledge and experience with the task they're going to perform. And you really want to create a safe learning environment. And so, for example, if if your trainee on service is an off-service PGY1 from family medicine, they're going to have a very different knowledge base, uh, very different skills and very different objectives for the rotation than a PGY3 internal medicine resident. So understanding their experience to date, um, their background, their objectives are quite important. And this ties into that expectation piece, the second component, where you discuss their specific learning goals so that PGY1 family medicine resident may want to work on their approach to anemia, whereas a PGY3 internal medicine resident may want to work on their approach to managing acute chest syndrome. And so when you, when you complete these two steps, the rapport and expectations, they form the foundation of a good coaching relationship, and they create um, a safe learning environment for feedback. And it really emphasizes the importance of psychological safety. And that psychological safety is essentially making sure that our residents feel supported and they know that they're not going to be penalized or shamed if they're asking questions or they make a mistake. Then we move into the observation piece, and this one can be observed or um, indirect. Uh, the coaching, um, so the fourth component, essentially is where you provide informational feedback. So your perspective of how you felt they performed, but you also give actionable feedback. And so you're essentially giving them recommendations on how they can improve. And by giving them tangible tasks to work on, this is, I think, as a learner, easier for them to uh, incorporate that feedback. And you ideally want to get agreement with the trainee on these actionable steps. And then the last piece is record. And sometimes we give oral feedback and we don't need to record it. But if we're doing, say, IDERS or uh, in trustable professional activities, if we are recording, I think the key is to remember we want to be able to justify the ratings. So by giving specific examples, writing in a supportive manner, and providing uh, recommendations on how to improve, we want it to, to be detailed enough that if an independent reviewer looks at it, they can, under, they can understand how we got to the rating we got to. But at the end of the day, um, uh, for feedback, you know, the literature is quite clear on what makes you um, feedback useful. There are two things. It's really being specific and really giving recommendations to trainees on how to get better. The um, I'm not going to get in too much into the R2C2 framework. I just want to highlight that there's other frameworks that exist to give feedback and Whatever uh, one you're comfortable with, um, as long as there's an approach I think is helpful. The R2C2 is very similar to the RxOCR. You're essentially building a relationship. Um, so you're really forming that, that coaching relationship. You're exploring the reaction. Um, you're confirming the content. So you're working with the trainee to develop a shared focus on what they can work on. And then you're coaching for change and by and co-creating an action plan. So you're essentially identifying one goal the learner um, can work on. And so when we think about feedback um, in the context of consultative, uh, apologies, consultative skills, there's no specific literature on that. There's, there's actually no literature on feedback in consultative skills specifically. But what I've done and what I think is reasonable is to extrapolate the, the general medical education literature on feedback and extrapolate that to consultative skills. And so ultimately, if you're giving feedback on their ability to uh, request a consult, so that referral process, uh, then you can go back to those models, the five C's, the peaked, um, the consult model, and you can guide um, your content of the feedback uh, based off of did they address the components of those models. Um, and if you are giving feedback to the trainee on how to provide a consultation, you can go back to the 10 recommendations uh, by Salerno and again use those pieces to say to, to identify what they did well and maybe what they missed. And then I think again it's important to frame your feedback in an approach. So for example, the RxOCR. And again, keeping in mind those tips for effective feedback. Uh, 
Um, and then another thing to keep in mind when we talk about feedback for consultative skills, again, it depends on what, uh, um, what specialty the residents are in, but there are entrustable professional activities that focus specifically on consultative skills. So for example, internal core internal medicine residents, the foundations of discipline, I believe number three is um, a consulting specialist and other health professionals. So that's that referral consultation piece. And then uh, for core medicine residents, the core of discipline, uh, EPA, I believe again, number three, is providing internal medicine consultation to other clinical services. So again, now that providing um, consultation piece. So uh, there are EPAs as well that you can do when you are trying to um, uh, assessment for learning of, of consultation skills. So I'll end that here and open it up to questions. I do have references um, at the end. I'll just kind of highlight through them um, just so in case anybody has um, any specific rec reference they want. If anyone has uh, questions. All right, great. Thank you very much, Dr. David, for an expert overview of, uh, I'm sure all of us as consultants are, are learning stuff here, you know, things that we're just doing by feel uh, or by habit uh, and, and having some academic rigor to knowing how to really do, the, do these consultancy uh, skills uh, in the best possible way. So there is one question so far in the Q&A and I welcome others to please feel free to enter any questions you have into the Q&A section on Zoom here. Uh, or also we do have the option if you wish to ask your question, uh, please raise your hand on the Zoom feature and we can unmute you. So there's a question here from Dr. Graham Jones. Great presentation. I've always found feedback a struggle. The paradox of language is that the words I use mean what I mean and the words heard mean what the listener wants. How much is done to train trainees on how to receive feedback? How can we improve the feedback given by trainees to programs and teachers, uh, which in my experience has always been unhelpful? And it's a great question. Um, I don't know that we give much training to trainees on how to receive feedback. I know we do training to more senior learners on how to give feedback. Um, I don't think there's uh, that I've had or that I've uh, noticed any training to trainees on how to receive feedback. And when, I, when I've gone through the literature on, on feedback, that's not something that's come up. And I think that's a really important point. And I think it goes back to that. Is, um, I think when we uh, get into med school, we're uh, used to uh, uh, being uh, being the best. We get into clerkship and rotations. We always want to hear you're great, but that's not what's going to make us uh, ready to practice. And so, and I think that's where shifting that mindset of uh, feedback is to grow as a trainee and uh, things like entrustable professional activities. I think sometimes we see it as assessment of learning where we're really just trying to assess the trainee, but it's, but we should look at it as assessment for learning where there's an opportunity to get feedback on that observation. And so um, I think that's a great uh, point that we're not um, providing um, that piece to trainees. And then the second question, how can we improve the feedback given by trainees uh, uh, to programs and teachers? Uh, sorry, so the trainees giving feedback. Um, I think, again, it's just uh, when we, so we are giving, uh, there is some training uh, for trainees on how to give feedback. For example, this year, the PGME offered a uh, teaching residents, uh, like a resident as teacher day, and it was typically more senior learners, uh, PGY2 and up, on how to uh, give feedback. But again, that was focused more on feedback to other trainees instead of um, 
how they could give more feedback to programs and and teachers because I think that's the other piece is when I work with trainees and I ask them for feedback on how I supervise them I find in general the answer is you're great and I think that that's more that power imbalance where I fill out their either at the end of the day and they obviously don't want to say anything that might impact that recognizing that constructive feedback is always helpful mm -hmm. thank you so much and yeah that that power imbalance is always kind of in the back of our minds right and trying to make sure that we create safer spaces and spaces where the learners feel really, really comfortable uh, being honest as much as possible, but recognizing there are some structural aspects to that that just make it difficult. Um, so I, uh, so the question that I have is, I, I find that a lot, you know, uh, learners at all stages of their medical learning, there's really a lot to be processing and trying to be to absorb between all of the content, the surroundings, you know, the, the, the work environment, working with new staff, new trainees all the time, kind of the, the changing team structure. And then on top of that, um, kind of giving, giving them, um, trying to give them the tools uh, in terms of all of these more professionalism aspects and, and, um, developing their professional identity in a in a really healthy, robust way. Um, and I just wonder, you know, as we come up with all of these uh, checklists and kind of remember, remember when you're calling uh, with a consult, you have to do the, you know, you have to go through the acronym and it's like just one more acronym um, to, to add. Um, you know, how do we make that maximally intuitive? Um, how do we kind of convey like the global um, attitudes, I guess, you know, how does the, how does, how do the checklists weave together with more of those professional attitudes um, and, uh, you know, those kind of golden rule things of, of, you know, ultimately we all want to be treating one another as we would wish to be treated in any of these environments. I'm just wondering on your kind of perspective on that, Victoria, both as an educator and as someone who's gone through a lot of training yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I agree. Giving giving trainees more checklists makes it uh, makes it hard. Uh, but uh, if we're you know focusing more on that professional piece, um, I think one of the things that came up a lot when we interviewed people about consultancy skills was uh, being supportive and being empathetic. And there was a lot of um, uh, people like examples that were brought up of when they called. Uh, or when they were called for a consult, uh, the person on the other end was uh, rude or abrasive or vice versa. Um, and I think it's uh, important to recognize that, uh, and this is something that I was told early on in my training by a supervisor, and that's really stuck with me, is when a service is calling you for advice, they need your help. So it may seem like a really straightforward question to you, and it may seem really obvious, but they don't know the answer they, they, they want your help so they can help this patient. And so there's being rude is not helping that situation. You're just essentially making them feel bad, whereas you just need to go and help them. And so I find um, sometimes if so, and this is something I've told trainees is I find if they're concerned that uh, the person on the other end may not be as supportive or empathetic, frame it as we really need your help. People don't tend, I, at least I find people don't tend to get um, like people will, will tend to, st uh, to be more helpful if you frame it that way. Um, but, but I've had experiences where, um, you know, trainees are, um, really nervous. And I had a trainee once who, um, I was on service and I was the staff and I guess, um, I, they, I had no, no trainees and the, the ret or it was a medical student who called me directly and they started out with the consult by, I apologize. I'm calling you directly. You have no one working, like you have no resident on your service. And they were, they, they then apologized and said, I don't know the story really well. So please, please don't yell at me. And I hadn't even said anything. And it really speaks to some of the environment that our trainees experience. And it, it, you know, it, it really, um, uh, th those are things that really concern me when you hear things like that. And I think, our trainees have to recognize there's a safe learning environment. And I think that's why we always have to be supportive and empathetic. And as we move up as trainees, uh, 
we have to stay that way because I find even trainees um, as you, you know, move up, maybe sometimes you're overwhelmed, you're quite busy, and uh, we may get frustrated when we get an extra consult and we feel, well, this is not really uh, a consult I need to do. And so I think uh, highlighting that to trainees early on and really emphasizing the importance of that being supportive, being empathetic, creating this safe learning environment for everybody, hopefully that stays with them. I'm not sure if that's helpful, uh, Dr. Hasek. 100%. And I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Ikasaka. There's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Sure. Uh, so thanks everyone for submitting your questions. We have a couple more here. So Dr. Ann Holbrook is hoping to ask you, uh, Victoria, uh, yeah. fundamental question. We are focusing on offering consultation, uh, but is there any evidence on exactly which consultation skills improve patient outcomes beyond providing a necessary procedure? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I didn't come across that specifically in the literature. Uh, I would imagine uh, this is just um, I'm inferring, but I would imagine that that collaborative piece where there's very clear communication between the consulting team and the MRP team would probably be the most important uh, uh, part. Uh, but I but I don't have any literature. Uh, none of the literature that I saw really addressed patient outcomes. It was very focused on trainee um, on how essentially to to teach trainees. Sounds good. Uh, so the next question is from Taryn Sims. Uh, interesting point from Graham. Prevalence of perfectionism in medicine can be a barrier to receiving constructive feedback in the spirit of self-improvement. I find myself making a self-deprecating comment and welcome feedback for myself with the expectation feedback should be bi-directional. And, oh, actually this is, <laughs> sorry, this is actually not a question, my bad. Uh, That's this okay. Is, this is a comment, of, of, uh, comment to you um, that uh, ever, everyone always has improvement to normalize the process of it. And, uh, giving you kudos yeah. for your talk. Yeah, and I and I agree with that. And I I think I have a, uh, I think one of the experiences that I have that may be a bit different than uh, some of the current trainees, I did engineering as my undergrad and failing was very common. Um, and it normalized failing early on in my academic career. And I think that's, um, that's maybe something that may, that when I got into med school, uh, failing was no longer a very common thing. And, and it, it was a very interesting shift for me. And I, and I still struggle because when I went into med school, then I almost embrace that, oh, well, you can't fail uh, mentality. So I think normalizing it and being open about it, I think is important. And uh, I think there was a question that was pulled over from the chat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cox. Uh, the value of giving feedback in the presence of rapport and an existing relationship is understood. Since much of our clinical work is sessional, uh, one week of service or weekly clinics, have you advice for giving feedback in the absence of a, of a robust relationship? Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, one of my staff, I, I'd actually discussed this with one of my staff a few years ago, and um, she felt that it's even with like a short amount of time, you can still build that relationship. Um, so if on the first uh, first day or two, you really um, focus on getting to know the trainee, uh, what is their background, what is their training, what are their interests, what have they done? Uh, you know, it doesn't take a significant amount of time, but if you do those things, you can, um, the trainee will feel like you're invested in them. You, you care about them as a person, um, even though they're only there for maybe that week. And you you really want to help them improve, and especially if then they tell you what they want to work on, and then you then will um, uh, you know arrange to have uh, feedback specifically on that. So if they want to work on their spleen exam or their lymph node exam, and then you say, okay, well, um, let's work on that Wednesday. Then the trainee will feel that you're invested in specifically their goals, and I think that helps that relationship, even if it is just a short time. Great, thank you. Um, and at this point, I don't see any more questions coming through. So I think we can uh, look to wrap up. And once again, thank you so, so much, Dr. David, for um, all this important work that you're doing uh, together with your collaborators and, and mentors. Um, and we wish you all possible success in, in the home stretch of your master's. Um, thanks to everyone who attended today.
We do have uh, our next medical grand rounds next week on April 27th, which will be uh, HHS hosted. Dr. Mohanad Abu Hilal will be presenting from dermatology. And following that on May 4th will be Chair's Medical Grand Rounds with Dr. Hendrik uh, Poiner. So we've got a couple of great sessions coming up. And uh, thanks again for attending and uh, wishing everybody a fantastic day. Take care. <laughs>